The Unshackled Waves, episode 186. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. While new Prime Minister Scott Morrison is attempting to talk about policy and ideas, the aftermath of the way he ascended to the Prime Ministership is what is dominating the news cycle. There have been claims from Turnbull supporters of bullying from the Dutton camp and also leaks against Peter Dutton about his ministerial interventions to stop the deportation of two au pairs. Speaking of bullies, the CIF MEU Victorian State Secretary John Secco on Father's Day used his children to send a vile message out to his political opponents. Opponents. At a state level, not all is well in Queensland with a radical abortion decriminalisation bill before the parliament and Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk is punishing the state Catter Party for, uh, for uh, Fraser Anning's maiden speech in the Senate by removing their extra staff. To discuss all this, I'm joined once again by the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, as I stated in my introduction, even though Parliament's not sitting this week, we are well and truly still dealing with the aftermath of the, the Liberal leadership spills. And uh, just after we recorded last week's show, it was uh, announced that uh, Julia Banks, who's the Liberal MP for the uh, marginal Victorian seat of Chisholm, she'll retire after one term in Parliament. She uh, launched a blistering attack on the, the Liberal Party in a resignation letter uh, saying that the leadership change was the last straw and talked about how there was a, a culture of bullying and intimidation, uh, not just during the spills, but throughout her time as an MP and said that it was a, a bad culture for women. She did not name any particular MPs or, or party figures, but it certainly launched a, or another firecracker within an already uh, fiery uh, Liberal Party. <laughs> there are more and more powder kegs just waiting to be ignited in the Liberal Party, Tim. Um, usually I would be suspicious of these complaints, but the fact is, whether we like it or not, there is a lot of wheeling and dealing that goes on in Canberra and a lot of people, a lot of MPs and even senators will face pressure to vote in a certain way on certain matters simply because it benefits the party rather than the electorate. So her complaints, while potentially easy to dismiss, should be taken seriously, at least in terms of being considered as being an actual um, an actual issue in this case. Uh, but to my knowledge, she has not yet named anyone in regards to this, so it could just be hot air. It's worth noting that Julia Banks, she's a moderate uh, within a, an increasingly conservative Victorian uh, division of the Liberal Party, where the uh, factional stouses have been uh, quite intense lately. And yes, uh, people's uh, pre-selections are threatened uh, all, all the time during uh, these sort of votes, but uh, the, the Victorian Admin C Committee, they uh, recently re-endorsed all the sitting members uh, in Victoria, so her pre-selection uh, wasn't uh, uh, under threat, but uh, clearly uh, everyone's uh, pointed out that uh, Julia Banks, she's you know, no precious petal or snowflake. She's She had a successful legal career before she uh, entered Parliament and she was able to actually win Chisholm off the, the Labor Party, the only uh, coalition MP to uh, win uh, a seat off the Labor Party at the, the last election. So it is a big blow and it is sad that she feels that uh, she has to uh, retire and her claims were backed up by, by other female uh, Liberal MPs. Kelly O'Dwyer was on 7.30 Monday night. Uh, Linda Reynolds, uh, she spoke in the Senate, a uh, WA Liberal Senator, about uh, bullying and intimidation. And uh, pro probably less, uh, I'd say, noteworthy is Lucy Gachui. She said she was going to name uh, MPs under parliamentary 
privilege. She's the uh, Liberal senator who uh, was originally elected as a family first senator to replace uh, uh, Bob Day, and she was recently bumped to number four on the Liberal uh, Senate ticket at the next election, unwinnable position. But given her uh, checkered uh, senat senatorial career where she uh, billed taxpayers for uh, flying her family down for a belated 50th birthday party. Um, I'm not sure if her uh, claims carry the same weight. Mm -hmm. well, it'll be interesting to see if Senator Gachui actually follows through with her threat to name and shame people under the parliamentary privilege. So my suspicions and that's what takes away from um, Ms. Banks' allegations and the validity in those, the accuracy of those. That's why I'm suspicious. I'm a naturally suspicious and skeptical person, but it makes me even more so. It seems like a lot of, you know, the cynic in me says it's a lot of sour grapes from the Turnbull loyalists at the whole process. Oh, it was, it was a pretty bruising battle from both sides. I mean, the, the Dutton forces, they, they played uh, pretty hard. They're, they're, there's no uh, denying that. And uh, well, The Dutton forces didn't do anything. There was never going to be a challenge until certain people who shall remain nameless said to him, look, Peter, you've got to do this. That's what it came down to. He didn't want, he wasn't any animosity between him and Turnbull at that point. It was oh, just no, not between the, the, the pair, but certainly the people who... He was basically drafted in Peter Dutton as the, the, the Conservatives, as their man. Yeah. yeah, that was the idea. But he didn't really want to do it himself. Yeah. It wasn't It wasn't Peter himself. Sorry, it wasn't Dutton himself. It was the people around him agitating for us. And I'm actually not including Tony Abbott in that, to be honest. Um, but that's another story for another time. The thing is, when people say, oh, it was really bruising, the Dunn cap really bruising, that's, I'm sorry, Tim, I, I'm going to call that crap because the Turnbull faction was leaking relentlessly against Tony Abbott from day one when he was prime minister. And when Dutton did actually put his hand up for a spill, all this, all these things about Dutton conveniently came out. Hmm. And people saying he was, he and his cap were being bruising. Mm, I, no, I don't, I don't see that. Oh well, yeah. The the Turnbull forces that they they did manage to get. Oh, they they didn't get their first choice, which was Turnbull to stay, but they got their preferred candidate up uh, in the end, uh, Scott Morrison. So. Uh, I don't think there's too much of a reason for them to be uh, salty, but uh, uh, obviously that there, there is a lot of uh, uh, bitterness about what happened, and uh, as we'll, we'll get to in a moment, there's been a lot of uh, leaking from the, the, the Turnbull side, even though Morrison was their candidate, they, they don't seem to want to help him out too much. Mm. Morrison unfortunately it's probably going to end up being like Fadden who is unable to hold the coalition together in the 1940s but we can always discuss that later on another show um, when it comes to the general election and either March or May next year. Now uh, Scott Morrison is vowed to investigate these uh, claims of, of bullying and there's no, uh, people have pointed out, there's no real uh, internal uh, processes for dealing with this and it's, it's interesting Labour uh, taking the moral high ground on this uh, issue they're saying oh well with Emma Husa we put a uh, independent uh, investigation to, to look into the the bullying claims which ironically it looks like they actually did the right thing with this <laughs> yes well it did take them quite some time before they pulled the rug out from under Husa to be fair mm. Whereas Scott Morrison has actually said outright, I will investigate this if there is something wrong here. So a big difference between, you know, the, um, the culture of covering up that is notorious within the Liberal, uh, within the Labour Party rather, compared to the Liberal Party who's like, we, do we actually have a problem? Okay, we need to sort this out. That's one thing I'll give credit to the Liberal Party. 
And uh, also the media has been, or they, they've reopened the, the question of if the Liberal Party has a woman problem. I mean, let's not forget that they only have uh, 18 uh, MPs who uh, are women. Uh, they've resisted having a quota, quota system. Uh, but uh, it's, and they always talk about how they want to encourage more, more women uh, to, to run. And yeah, they have most of the, the, the complaints about bullying and intimidation have come from uh, female uh, MPs. I think the only, uh, only male is uh, Craig Laundy, who says that he's uh, burnt out from the, the whole uh, experience. I, I mean, is this a valid criticism or is there another reason why women just aren't putting their hands up for liberal pre-selection? Unlike the unlike the Labor Party, the Liberal Party works on on its pre-selections in terms of merit. So it doesn't matter what the gender is. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, or you know, in theory, you know, you could even have a an Apache helicopter, someone who identifies as an Apache helicopter, uh, running for pre-selection and getting pre-selected if said Apache helicopter had better credentials and more votes than the may either the male or the female pre-selection candidate they they but they base it on merit i have never heard anybody with any serious gravitas in the liberal party complaining about the way pre-selections are done and i've never heard any of them say that they support a quota yeah i don't know how to uh, to fit like because, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad thing if uh, the Liberal Party was to get a few more uh, female MPs. But, of course, a quota is exactly the, the wrong way to go about it. We'll create more friction uh, within the, the, uh, the Liberal Party. And um, I, uh, f I, I'm not sure about you, but uh, I don't think the Labor Party's necessarily improved in its uh, policies uh, just because it has a quota system. Well, Labor's never had many real good policies for the past four or five decades, so that goes without saying. And the Liberal Party needs to be careful they don't fall into the same trap of having inadequate policies. But, oh wait, they already have, my bad. Um, anyway, point is, uh, the great female leaders within, or deputy leader, rather, in the case of Julie Bishop, she didn't require a quota to become uh, the MP for her electorate. Um, when you go back, if you go back quite a way back in history, Dame Enid Lyons, the, the wife of the former Prime Minister Joe Lyons, also didn't, receive, didn't require a quota. The, it's, the idea of quotas is, it's actually abhorrent to me because of the fact that it undermines Merit. You, you, could, you could have someone who's much more talented in the under a quota system. You could have someone who's much more talented, but who gets denied just because he is a man, for example. And the woman may be okay, but she's not, you know, meritorious in the same way that her male counterpart was in that pre selection. So that's why I hate the idea of a, a gender quota. It's not going to, it's not going to help the cause of the party or the electorate necessarily. And a lot of people have been saying that uh, given that all these bullying and intimidation claims are coming from uh, women, uh, it's, it, it's putting out the perception there that women, they, they can't handle the, the robustness of uh, pol uh, politics that if you're trying to make the case for more women in politics, then uh, basically crying, uh, bullying, and one you know pulling the pin, it, it doesn't exactly make a good case for why there should be more of them. Well, you could also say that as well. I mean, that's not what I would say, but you could make that argument as well quite reasonably. Politics is a mugs game. It's a very brutal, very unforgiving, relentless game, and. You know, if you if you if you're looking to get into politics for the purpose of self-aggrandizement, don't don't do it. It's just going to end up in tears for you and for all the people that you end up letting down. 
Uh, Peter Dutton, the man who almost uh, was Prime Minister, he's uh, been the, the target of uh, some v uh, very uh, intentional leaks to damage his uh, tough guy image in Home Affairs. He's, he's back as Home Affairs Minister, even though he's been stripped of the, the immigration portfolio. He were, he, it, it's been revealed that he uh, granted uh, tourist visas to two OU pairs uh, who are against the advice of his uh, department. Uh, now, what is an au pair? Uh, it's a domestic assistant from a foreign country working for and living as part of a host family. I didn't know what a au pair was until this uh, whole thing uh, uh, happened, but uh, uh, there you go. That it's uh, from its description, it's a very grey area of. Uh, the, oh, well, of when a, an au pair comes to Australia because they're, they're living with a host family and obviously performing nannying duties, uh, but they're being paid in the form of like they get free accommodation, free food. So it's a very uh, employment grey area. Mm, it, it is, it is. And without looking beyond the surface or sorry beneath the surface of the situation it does seem to the untrained eye that perhaps Darton did do a favor for um mr mclaughlin but yes the ceo of the afl who uh wrote a letter to peter dutton on behalf of his uh, second cousin and the, the, the second intervention was a former police colleague of his in Queensland mm -hmm. well in, in regards to the first intervention the McLaughlin intervention uh, it, it is a gray area and from what I was reading of it and I admittedly didn't read that much of it because I've been more concerned about the upcoming Nigel Farage events tonight in Brisbane and also the March for Life on Saturday that has just gone by. Um, what I saw was that the the department advised against a granting a visa, but it was done on very, very flimsy grounds. It was done on the admission of the um, visa recipient herself, which may may have been co may or may not have been coerced but regardless of whether it's co coerced or not uh, if you're trying to explain um, if you're trying to explain why you're here if you're trying to be a nanny or versus being a tourist there are certain um, there are certain nuances in the language that you use to explain Oh, I'm here as a tourist, but I'm also looking to be part of the family. It's 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 quite it's quite um it's quite tricky. It's that grey area, like like you pointed out. It's that grey area, and the fact is, it, it's really tricky to explain. And yeah, it's just. I don't think Dunn did anything wrong. I mean, Dunn doesn't have to listen to this department all the time at all. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, the interesting thing is, you know, people will complain about Dutton giving preferential treatment to someone who is a big shot in uh, public life. But what they don't talk, what they, what the Labour Party especially has to be very careful about is the fact that Tony Burke decided to write a letter to one of our embassies advocating for the granting of a visa to basically someone whose hate speech makes uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and Coulter and all the usual suspects look like a bunch of pansy liberals by comparison. The guy that he wanted to get a visa, that Tony Burke wanted to get a visa for, believes that homosexuals should be killed and that it they should be thrown off a rooftop. They should be executed. It's it's not very pleasant, you know, and just hateful things. And just basically bagging out Australia, saying, you know, the what was the phrase used? The rubbish the rubbish dumps of Syria are more pleasant than the gardens of Australia. 
because you have a 50% chance of seeing your son with an earring in his right ear. It, it was, you know, the Labor Party really wants to stop casting stones at their glass house, otherwise they're going to get very cold very quickly. The immigration minister has always had this power to override the decisions or recommendations of uh, their department and, and mm. bureaucrats to avoid uh, unfair and unreasonable uh, decisions or, or reverse them, uh, given that we know from experience that uh, bureaucrats, uh, when they're applying the law, can uh, it can lead to uh, outcomes which to the uh, regular person can look uh, absurd. And yes, uh, Labor uh, po uh, politicians, they, they've uh, written to the, the Immigration Minister, I think Peter Dutton said uh, 63 times he's been written to uh, uh, from uh, Labor MPs, or he called it a dirt file, but he uh, retracted uh, that, uh, that saying that, look, uh, I'm asked to make these interventions uh, all the time, there's a, there's a reason uh, f uh, for this, but I think the reason why Labor and the Greens, they're, they're planning a move, uh, a move to, uh, in, the, in the House, move a motion of no confidence against uh, Peter Dutton, which would essentially remove him as a, a minister. They're thinking that uh, because uh, the coalition is one seat down because Malcolm Turnbull's resigned from Wentworth, they're in with a, a chance. But I think the reason why uh, Labor and the Greens, they're, uh, they're, they're running with this uh, so hard, even though they, they probably don't oppose the minister having this power, it, it is because uh, Peter Dutton he, uh, intervened on behalf of uh, two white women. And of course, the, the you know, racial uh, undertones of that. Yeah, it's just cynical point scoring as much as they can get. The motion will most likely fail regardless. And even if it does succeed, there is... I could be wrong here, but there's nothing in the standing orders that says that just because the minister faces, any minister faces a motion of no confidence, barring the prime minister, that the minister has to immediately resign his or her commission. They can censure the minister but actually having him removed by process of that vote alone, I do not believe that is the case. That being said, he might choose to resign anyway if the motion goes against him simply because it's not good for optics. Oh, the motion's not going to succeed. I mean, Labor and the Greens are going to try, but uh, even when uh, the, the government was two seats uh, short during the, the dual citizenship, uh, saga. They they still never lost a, a vote on the on the floor of the the, the parliament. So this is uh, just a another another stunt from uh, Labor Labor and the Greens, uh, obviously trying to to capitalise on this and the fact that they're uh, as we mentioned before the Turnbull forces are leaking against uh, Dutton and there's uh, been a lot of people saying that. Can you imagine if Peter Dutton had actually won and this uh, scandal was breaking during the, the first week of his prime ministership? I mean, imagine they probably got even more on Peter Dutton that if he did become leader that they'd want to leak. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to keep leaking against him regardless, simply because they want, their loyalists want to punish him for what they perceive as his role in, role in Turnbull. Even though at the end of the day, Turnbull chose to resign. So, you know, but people hold irrational grudges for a very, very long time. I mean, yeah, as, as we mentioned, even though it's appropriate for the minister to have this power, it's the, it's the fact that he's, he's made, Peter Dutton, he's made his image being the tough guy in immigration, you know, no exceptions. I don't want to give any signal that it's easy to get into Australia. And then he said, oh, I've looked at these two cases and I've uh, thought that the, I don't think he's used the word uh, compassionate or humanitarian, but the, uh, the right thing to do was to allow these uh, women to, to stay. And yeah, that, that's, a, that's another factor in this uh, leak is the fact that they want to uh, ruin his uh, strong man image and say, hey, he's not as tough as you thought he was. Mm. Oh, absolutely. The, anyone leaking against another person is, is what they call the opposition research. They will find all the chinks in the armour that they can. So in Dunn's case, they're showing him as 
the strong man with the strong armor, but it still has chinks in it, pointing out all the little chinks in the armor and using that as a way to undercut the rest and undercut him. It's... It's a lot of people do. A lot of people, politicians will do this to other politicians. They will not so much leak, but they will they will keep their dirt files on opponents. Every politician, every aspiring politician, has a dirt file on him or her. It's that simple. It's that dirty, which is why I call it a monk's game. Speaking of bullies, probably one of the, the biggest bullies in Australia is the, or well, they're now the CFMMEU, uh, which is the Construction, Forestry, Mining, Maritime and Energy Union. Now their uh, Victorian uh, State Secretary, John, uh, John Secker, he recently had uh, blackmail uh, charges against him uh, uh, dropped, which uh, w was considered a uh, vindication of his activity, even though he's he said to construction bosses, you know, we know, you know, where 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 you are, where you live, you better w uh, watch your back. Uh, he had uh, what do you call it? A charming Father's Day message to the Australian Building and Construction Commission, where he had his two kids uh, tweeted a photo of them holding up a sign which uh, read, "Go get fucked." Now I'm not sure if they. Because the, the tweet's now been deleted, I've seen a, a picture of the tweet with the, the children's faces blacked out, and I'm not sure if, this, if the, the fuck was bleeped in the original tweet or if the media uh, has, but regardless, we know exactly what was meant by that. And I just can't believe that on Father's Day, you'd make your children send out just that, you know, awful, like, profane message mm -hmm. well it's it goes to his character to show that um he's prepared to use his children as political tools to say the least but to use them for something like this is just abhorrent in fairness to him though he did actually say later on after he deleted the tweet saying you know i probably shouldn't have done that but even and, so, the fact that he did it in the first place is kind of a it's, a, it's a jerk move, you know? It's a jerk move. You don't use your kids for something like that. I mean, why use your kids to say something that you, you can just as easily say and have said on numerous occasions? Yeah, it's, it's, the thing was, it wasn't just that, you know, he got his phone out and just, like, tweeted that in a brain snap. It was he got his children, like, there was a lot of thought that went into it, and this is why it's so bad. A lot of thought that went into it. You, you gave your kids the sign, got them to hold it up, took a photo of it, and then tweeted it out again. I mean, there's a lot of thought that went into it. It's not just like, oh, you know, I had a lapse of judgment. I mean, it was thought out. Exactly. Such a thing was premeditated. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a bit hard to say. If he had if he had deleted it sooner, he might have been able to say, oh, that was a brain snap, I made a mistake. But it was up there for a while. I mean, the Australian got their hands on it, other media organisations got their hands on it, we got our hands on it. So it was up there for a while. There was no brain, like you said, there was no brain snap. It was right and, it was right there that it was a you know carefully considered very bad admittedly pr stunt to um i'm trying to think of the polite way to phrase this to tell the abcc where to where to put it now whenever a union official does something vile and it happens quite a lot there was uh, these uh workers who'd been locked out of a mine for several months they uh, f uh made threats to rape the the children of the the mine uh, operators you've always got to watch out for how the the other members of the union movement and of course the labor party uh react to this because there, there's always, uh, uh, it seems to be an unwritten rule uh, within the left that you you never uh, criticise a, a fellow member of the movement. It's always solidarity for forever, uh, don't, don't punch left. Well, uh, f obviously this was indefensible and so Bill Shorten and Tanya Plibersek said that, oh, you know, I, I've uh, 
didn't didn't like the tweet and I'm glad that it was uh, deleted and there's always you know, going to be bad uh, people in in any uh, political uh, movement uh, and, and of course they tried to turn it back on the, the liberals saying oh there's you know bullies in the in the Liberal Party uh, as well and uh, Scott Morrison said that uh, in response to the tweet he would uh, he would look at uh, deregistering the the CF MMEU, which was sort of like, wow, it, 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 it took you that tweet to realise that they're uh, not not a, not a union that uh, uh, play, uh, plays fair, and so so basically the the uh, Labour Party is they, they've they've got to the stage where they've conceded that yeah this union is a bit out of hand and we don't really want to be uh, associated with this guy and it's sort of like wow that's that, that's significant progress but it's also significant progress on uh, Scott Morrison's part that wow you you just realize now that you know this union is you know one, one of the worst for, for thuggery and intimidation and <laughs> does a lot more bullying than uh, probably your side of politics is ever capable of mm, exactly and I think it's it's not so much that he didn't realize i think it's more a matter of he finally has a flagrant example of just how thuggish the union movement can be or certain individuals within the union movement to be fair i mean obviously not all unionists are uh, scumbags like that but there are quite a few especially at the top who are as well so those are the ones you've got to watch for uh there was actually a precedent uh, mentioned to me in uh, some of my conversations over the past few days saying that I believe it was Bob Hawke who actually suspended the Builders La Building and Labourers Federation Building Labourers Federation in the 1980s for yeah. some reason so it could be done to suspend CFM and the EU and the funny thing is it wouldn't just be us cheering if that happened Tim, there'd be quite a few people secretly within the Labour Party who would actually be very happy for that as well. There have been a few people who have been saying to me lately, it, within the Labour Party, who have been saying the CFFMMEU should be disaffiliated from the Labour Party at large. And this is just another example. I mean, the fact that the Labour Party has not really come out and condemned the behaviour of John Setka and his cronies... Actually, no, I'm not going to use the word crazy. I'm going to use the word goons. Mm -hmm. To They haven't come out and criticised Setka's behaviour or that of his goons. It's like, you know what? You're getting your money from what is essentially an organisation that bullies people, that would terrorise people if they could get away with it. And you know what? You suspend them or we... <laughs> or we... um. We take action to suspend them for you. Now, Michael, you're based in uh, Brisbane. There's been a lot happening uh, up there lately. There was a, a March for Life uh, there uh, last Saturday, which uh, had, well, I think it was around 3,000 people show up because there's this uh, really radical uh, abortion bill that's before the, the, the Queensland Parliament under your uh, dear leaders, uh, Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and her deputy, uh, Jackie Trad. So can you... Uh, just explain uh, what the the bill entails and uh, what uh, what the march was like on Saturday. Okay, put simply, the uh, the march was about three to four thousand people. It was even bigger than the rally for South Africa that was held earlier in the year. Um, there were three senators there: um, Senators Canavan and Stoker from the LNP. Um, Senator Fraser Anning was there, or though not as a speaker, and uh, Mark Robertson MP, who is the state member for, uh, it used to be, it used to be um, Cleveland, it's called something else, it's called another C now, but anyway, a member of state parliament on the LNP side was there as well. Uh, you had people from all across uh, the political spectrum, people who usually wouldn't vote necessarily conservative but who are concerned about these bills. The problem with these bills, actually there's several problems with these bills. I mean, I'm pro-life, you know that. But the biggest problem I have with these bills is that it makes the prior proposed bills of Rob Pine 
the Labour turned independent MP in the last, say, Parliament look tame by comparison. There is no room for conscientious objection in this proposed bills, the bills brought by Jackie Trad, the Deputy Premier. Um, so if, but put it this way, I mean, there's, there's a lot more and it would take, probably take a whole another show to um, to explain what the problem is with it and why, but suffice it to say that if you're a doctor and you do not support abortion and someone comes to you looking for an abortion, you have to refer them to, you have to refer the patient to a doctor who will advocate for an abortion after two, 22 weeks. The law says, the law proposed law says you can abort your child after 22 weeks for any reason. So it's not socially convenient for you. You can kill it. It's going to cost you too much money. You can kill it. It's a girl and not a boy. You can kill it. It's a boy and not a girl. You can kill it. You, you, there are so many reasons why you can do it just for convenience. Yeah. If you want an abortion at any time during pregnancy, you can get it. Exactly. And you can do it through the public health system. That's the other thing that is being mooted as part of these proposed law changes. After 22 weeks, this is where the cutoff is. After 22 weeks is the cutoff where you can't just get it done on a whim. You have to go through a process of getting two doctors to say, but these, the doctors who do oppose abortion, they still have to refer patients onto another doctor who will be in favor of it. So they're still being morally, they're still being complicit, well, still being forced to be complicit, even though they personally oppose it. And there's no cooling off period for the decision to have an abortion either under the new uh, under the new proposals. So that's yet another reason. Uh, there was so much material because um, um, Martin Hartwick, our Brisbane editor, our Brisbane um, bureau chief was also there. Um, he was talking with people. We also had um, Ben Shand, aka the Dusty Bogan, interviewing a lot of people, interviewing um, the senators, um, Senators Canavan and Anning. And there are a lot of other people there that were being interviewed and um, sticking up for life and opposing these bills. Because the thing is, you don't have to be pro-life to oppose these bills. These bills violate conscience. These bills objectively violate conscience. And so as a result, I would say no, per no liberal person with a soul should support these bills. I thought the pine bills were bad but these bills are even worse, and... It's based on the Victorian law we have down here, which allows abortion up until birth. There's no conscientious objections for, for doctors. Mm -hmm. And of course, the next step after that will be exclusion zones around abortion clinics. And New South Wales, even though their abortion decriminalization bill failed because it was just uh, so uh, draconian it was it was even too much for the the the, the pro-abortion lobby they still managed to pass uh exclusion zones so it's it's really sad that there's this trend everywhere uh, even in the the conservative well so-called conservative states i mean queensland it's making a pretty far left turn uh that that's the trend here in australia no, well, that's the problem when you only have one chamber of parliament in, Queen, in, uh, in Queensland. You know, you can have massive turns as soon as you change government. The committee system doesn't do anything to install instill a sense of accountability. So the, gov the government, the Labour Party in this case, can do whatever the hell they want. It's, and the exclusion, but this exclusion zones, it's an interesting comment you make about exclusion zones because that is a big part of it. There's a 150 metre exclusion zone, but um, one more extreme proposal than that was to make it one kilometre, a one kilometre exclusion zone. Wow. So it's, you know, I don't think that will be accepted, or at least I hope it's not accepted, but you know, you never know. I mean, the person, the person pushing this bill well, let's just say if I were a priest, I would not be giving her communion. I'd be denying her communion and calling her out in front of the church if I were a priest and she came to me asking for it. That's yeah. how upset I am about these, these abhorrent bills. 
Now, another um, development in Queensland politics was that uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk, she's decided to punish the, the CADA party, which has three uh, MPs in the, the, the state parliament because uh, uh, Fraser Anning's uh, maiden speech and specifically the, the final uh, solution uh, comments, which is she, she, the, the state election was only at the end of last year and she granted these extra stuff, but now she's decided that she's going to take it away because she, she doesn't like what the, the new federal senator said. Yeah, exactly. It's an attack on, um, it obviously it's an attack on freedom of speech, but more importantly, more importantly than it being an attack on freedom of speech, it's also punishing the state division, uh, the state party for what something, for something that was done by the federal party. Oh, well, they didn't disavow it. That was the thing. Um... Oh, they didn't disavow it. Come on. If we just, if, if, if we wanted to apply that logic, Tim, if that, if we wanted to um, uh, apply that logic, then we should be saying, you know, with the Liberal Party, whenever it's in power, should be saying, oh, we're going to disavow, we, you, you haven't disavowed the criminal union behaviour or the borderline criminal union behaviour, so we're going to strip staffers from you. You know, and, li and likewise, um, you've got... Um, Oh, and the Labour Party's in power. Oh, wait, they've already been doing that. But they could do it to the Liberals saying, oh, your budget is done. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't even know what the polite, I don't even know the polite word is. It's a cluster. No, I'm not going to say that word. It's a, it's a mass. It's a mass of nonsense. It's a mass of absurdity. It's a mass of using political leverage as a way to punish everyone who's involved with them even remotely. But let's follow it through to the logical conclusion. Let's follow it through. Let's punish the Labour Party when the Liberal Party's in power. Let's punish the Liberals when the Labour Party is in power and so forth and so forth. This is only going to hurt the people in Queensland. And perhaps that's what they want. Perhaps that's what Palaszczuk wants is to hurt the electors in the Cata Party's three seats in Queensland saying, oh, they can't represent you properly, you should vote for us. That's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. It's not just about her feelings. As much as she says it is, it's not just about her feelings. She should know better. She's just being, she's just being petty, spiteful, capricious, and, 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 and eventually she's going to, she, eventually she's going to get burned for it because of the fact that this was actually raised to me by a former One Nation candidate that there is a possibility that um, she was violating due process and the um, standing orders by trying to um, affect a certain outcome, saying, you know, we'll restore these, we'll restore these staffers if you disavow what was said by your federal counterpart. That's, I mean, that's not bribery, but it's it's manipulation, it's blackmail, it's dubious behaviour at best, outright criminal at worst. And there was, I have to confirm this with my other sources, but I did recall seeing that there was actually a process being instigated against um, the Palaszczuk government in regards to the Triple C. So it could be very interesting. So this could have either really backfired for Palaszczuk or she'll get away with it. But regardless of whether she gets away with it or not, the Cata Party has just gotten a lot more sympathy both in North Queensland and in the rest of Queensland as well. Well, I've had a similar thing happen down here uh, with the Victorian Andrews Labor government where they uh, released 80,000 pages uh, of documents from Matthew Guy's opposition leader's time as planning minister over a rezoning he did on Phillip Island and later a reverse, which led to, to legal action. And releasing the, the, the papers from a previous uh, government that, that was only around uh, four years ago, that's a pretty un 
unprecedented and pretty dirty political move. And of course, as you were mentioning before, Matthew Guy said, well, if I win the election, I'm going to release all the documents over the, the East-West uh, link, the ripping up of those uh, uh, contracts and uh, over the uh, rorts for votes and the, the, the CFA uh, dispute. So that's the, you know, mm -hmm. by, by playing uh, dirty like this, you open up uh, yourself up to uh, all, all of the the, the negatives of this sort of radical, uh, unprecedented action. Implying that the Labor government hasn't already shredded and destroyed all those documents regarding the East-West Link, which cost them so much more money to cancel than it would have cost them to just build the bloody thing in the first place. Mm. But yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll probably end on, on that note. So things are, are bad in Canberra, but uh, in with the state governments in uh, Queensland and uh, Victoria, things are, are pretty grim there as well. Mm. Well, Parliament comes back uh, next week, so I'm sure there'll be a lot more uh, fireworks uh, then. So. Uh, we'll, we'll resume uh, next week and, and see uh, what, what's in the, the parliamentary news cycle then. So thanks once again, Michael. Thank you, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Nigel Farage's Tour of Australia is wrapping up, but if you're in Sydney or Melbourne, there is a, still a chance to get some last-minute tickets by going to nigellive.com.au. Next up to Australia is internet television personality and founder of The Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness, who appeared on the previous episode of this show and is pretty pumped to be coming and causing some mayhem here. He's being hosted by Penthouse Australia. You can book your place by going to gavinlive.com.au. Also, as always, please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash The Unshackled, or like many of you are doing, send us a direct contribution via paypal.me slash The Unshackled. It all goes a long way to keeping The Unshackled uh, functioning at this uh, high pace. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and comments.